Journey, your television passport to the exciting, colorful world of adventure. And here to present the actual films of tonight's bold journey is John Stevenson. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's journey takes us by light plane to a deserted island. The only sign of one-time human habitation is a lonely ghost ranch which is slowly crumbling into dust. This island is so secluded that a plane wrecked there laid undiscovered for many months. Strangely, this deserted spot is not thousands of miles away, but lies just off our Pacific coast, only 20 miles from civilization. It's the island of San Miguel. Centuries ago, San Miguel, with its great herds of elephant seals, was the home of Indians, who have long since disappeared. The people who tried to settle there since have also vanished. Wild but friendly foxes remain. But how did they cross the channel to get there? Here's the man who probed these mysteries, Mr. Ed Durden of Carpinteria, California. We'll meet this aerial explorer in just a moment. Friends, here's the adventurous pilot himself, Mr. Ed Durden. How are you, Mr. Durden? It's a pleasure to be here, John. Well, Mr. Durden, it strikes me that a deserted island is a wonderful place for an adventure. What first attracted you to the island of San Miguel? Well, John, the, my first attraction was uh, looking for an auxiliary landing field. I fly a great deal over the water, spotting uh, schools of fish for the commercial boats. And naturally, uh, when you're over the water, as most pilots will testify, their engine picks up noise. You can hear the connecting rods and all kinds of little noises. So when you pass over a small island, you, you ask yourself, the motor failed now, could I set her down safely? So that was really my first purpose in landing upon San Miguel. And when you did land there, it opened up a whole new world for you. Right, John. I saw the uh, many interesting things there and decided to tell a story on film. Well, I'm particularly fascinated with the stories of the foxes. Now, do you have any theories on how they got there? Uh, many people have asked that very same question. My theory, John, is that they were um, there originally when the, when the island was connected to the mainland. The second theory is that the Indians carried them over, which uh, I do not go for that theory myself. No, whatever it is, it's still conjecture. Right. Well, owning a private plane today is really catching on, but the big problem is maintenance and storage. Now, uh, where do you keep your plane? Well, I am very fortunate, John. Believe it or not, we keep the plane right in our backyard there at Carpinteria. And here my son, Ken, and I, who have planned this expedition for some time, are shown changing the small tires for extra large ones. Why is that? Well, John, there are no landing strips upon San Miguel Island, and the large tires will assist in bumpy landings, rough fields, can also assist in soft sand takeoffs. The airplane is especially constructed, John. It has large flaps, well fitted for this type of operation of landing in strange places, short field takeoffs. With all of our equipment on board, life rafts, plenty of water, and of course a big lunch, we slip into our Mae West life jackets. They're rather old, World War number two, but they do give you a feeling of confidence. That's my son, Kent, there. He is 18 and still attending college. Well, I'm anxious to see, Mr. Durden, how you get this plane out of your backyard. Well, John, it isn't exactly the backyard. The house that's just beyond the hangars uh -huh. there. We have a very nice strip. The underbelly shots, John, were taken with a camera mounted externally, and Kent was not strapped underneath the belly of the plane. <laughs> it's a beautiful day, and the trip is 60 miles over open water. This gives you a good idea of what it looks like. We're on our course now of about 210 degrees, which should take us to San Miguel. A flock of ducks pass by, and occasionally a very friendly looking steamer. We wish we could stay right above the steamer all the way there, John, but of course the steamer's only doing about 10 miles an hour, and we're doing about 100. Now, 35 minutes later, we approach San Miguel. You notice it's surrounded by dangerous shoals and reefs, and being located only 10 miles from the steamer lane, it's a definite hazard to shipping. Many boats and vessels have gone down in these waters. In fact, it is said that modern schooners and Spanish galleons rest side by side in the waters off San Miguel. It's very rough. Some of the roughest water uh, along the coast is found near San Miguel. Watch closely here, and you will see the remains of a very ancient vessel that was lost many years ago. Probably was running off course in the fog and struck this reef. We are bringing our little plane in for landing on the northwest side of the island. It was very bumpy, but she was built for it. The big tires were a great help there. 
How do you scout your landings before attempting one, Mr. Durden? Well, John, we fly very low, look things over, and then just stick our tongue in our cheek and come on in for the landing. There's a certain amount of risk and luck. We were greeted immediately by a beautiful pair of bald-headed eagles, our national bird emblem. And this is Kyler Harbor. It was in this harbor that the San Salvador and the La Victoria anchored in 1542 with Rodriguez Cabrillo on board. Now, Rodriguez Cabrillo was the man that discovered California, and it was while exploring this island of San Miguel that he received an injury which later cost him his life, and his crew members buried him in an unknown grave upon San Miguel. The grave has never been discovered. So this particular stone does not necessarily mark his grave, but uh, his memory. That's right. It is only a memorial. His grave has never been discovered, although there has been many efforts made to find it. Also, John, we discovered the small fox which lives upon the island. There were about two dozen of these little animals roaming around that we were able to see. Probably there were more. And here, with a little piece of hamburger, which Kent had brought along for the purpose, he promised to lure one of the little foxes within very close range so we can obtain some footage and more or less study and see just exactly what type of an animal it is. His first maneuver here is to imitate the cry of a wounded bird, and that attracts the little fox to start with. So, of course, he circles downwind and picks up the scent and gradually begins working his way toward the sound. He was very cautious. He'd go forward, and then he'd back up, and then he'd come forward again. But eventually, why, he did work his way toward Kent there, and of course, appetite was a large factor here. He could smell the scent, and eventually he did accept the tidbit. This is a wonderful study. Very cute little animals. I should say. And somehow, they have managed to survive all these many thousands of years, probably since the island was cut off from the mainland. And why were you when all this was going on? Well, uh, I filmed the picture and remained very quiet, living almost exclusively now on grasshoppers. And occasionally, I suppose, the little fox finds a bird's nest, like you see here. We noticed a few bird nests of the meadow lark and also the desert horned lark. Strange things. These birds inhabit the desert regions, and yet they fly across the channel to live on San Miguel. Also, we found a large number of seagulls. Here's the young gull very well camouflaged. Mother Seagull is very concerned, not wishing to distress her too much Why Kent places a little bird back in the nest. Well, we leave the little fox to his hunting there of insects and leave the seagulls and continue on around with our adventure here upon San Miguel. Well, you notice very rugged coastline there. Motor failure here would be embarrassing. Embarrassing is an understatement. <laughs> We had heard in advance that people used to live upon the island, and so flying along there, we noticed the, the remains of habitation. This is the old ranch. It's just a ghost ranch. There's nothing there now. And it was formerly used for raising cattle, and in later time, the raising of sheep. And we'll endeavor to land alongside the ranch here, and this is probably the closest call we had to losing our landing gear. Bob wire fence was approaching pretty rapidly here. Question of not whether we could stop. Throw out the anchor. <laughs> oh, well, made it. we're right side up, John, and that's considered a fair landing there on San Miguel. Any landing you can walk away from. Oh, that's it? right, John. The buildings were in very sad condition. You notice the water tank, one is still standing, one is down. The elements have taken their very heavy toll. This ranch was constructed in the year 1895, almost entirely of material salvage from a wrecked lumber schooner which had crashed upon one of the reefs. Now it's crumbling and decaying, very damp, everything covered with moss, and it's sort of a sad picture of what used to be. And another strange feature about the old ranch, it has round portholes for windows and sliding doors. Probably the portholes were an added protection against the very strong northwest winds. The old barn was in fair condition, probably the best preserved of all. The island is nine miles long, three miles wide, and there were no vehicles upon the island. And the horses probably played an important part in transportation. Inside the old barn, we still find the names of the horses that were used. The remains of the sheep endeavor 
Kent noticed here that the barn was still inhabited, not by man or animals, just by a pair of ravens. I've been to many, many strange places, John, and the raven always seems to be at home. He can make a living, and the deserts are very desolate places. And Kent said that if he couldn't see things very close, why, there was no use watching them. Now, Kent captures a little raven here, and of course, the mother's very unhappy giving him a buzz job there. So after a few minutes, why, Kent puts a little black robber down. On the mainland, they're quite a problem, and certain times of the year, they do rob other bird nests. I don't know Kent's qualifications, but he seems to know his way around animals and birds. Kent spends all of his spare time uh, in the hills, and although he's taken pre-dental at college, he's very interested in this sort of thing here. I might add that in taking the pictures of the landing and takeoffs, that we had to effect two landings and two takeoffs. The first takeoff, I left Kent on the ground. He took the pictures. And now you had to come back and pick up Kent to take off again on your right. exploration. Mm -hmm. Is that we, the case? You're right. I had to shoot the barbed wire fence once more. <laughs> Another very interesting feature we discovered upon San Miguel Island, John, was the remains of a prehistoric forest. Now, this land you see over the nose and that we're flying over right now was once covered with a very dense forest and lush vegetation. Now, in just a moment, why, we'll prove what we're saying here, John. Another amazing landing, Mr. Durden. On a slope, you always land on one wheel, else you would probably ground loop up the hill. At least that was my experience. Now, John, this forest was buried many, many years ago. San Miguel had a very damp climate at that time, and this forest you see here, this is the limbs of the forest sticking above the sand, where they were covered many thousands of years ago, and today they are being uncovered, John, by the terrific winds and shifting sand. Excuse me, Mr. Durden, you mean these are the uppermost branches of these buried trees? That's right, John. And you notice the casting here that is formed around the limbs of these trees? Yes. Very brittle, a casting, a crust, as much the same as you would fix up a broken arm. No trace of wood left here. What you see inside the casing is just dust or dirt. Then these trees, Mr. Durden, aren't petrified wood. No, John, they are not petrified. What you see is the limestone casing around what used to be the wood. Well, before we were looking at the uppermost branches, and now we're looking at the trunks. How do you explain that? In certain areas, the wind blows a little harder on the more exposed sections of the island, and therefore the tree has been uncovered all the way down. I see. Another indication of the damp climate that existed there, John, is the millions of snail shells which once roamed the island. Today, there are no snails upon San Miguel. This is not a sea snail. These are land snails, and there were millions of them around. We came upon a tragedy as we were walking through the prehistoric forest. This is a B-25 bomber which crashed 11 years before. It had taken off on a search mission for another plane and lost in the fog, she crashed upon this lonely island. There were 10 men on board, John, and no survivors. You see here the pilot seat or the co-pilot seat, and the wreckage was strewn over a, a wide area. Some people say this wreck lay here for months before being discovered. This was an Army Air Force plane. And there the old blade of the prop seems to point toward the sky, John, from where she came. It's quite a coincidence, isn't it, Mr. Durden, that with all the water surrounding this area, it would land on an island? She radioed that she thought she saw Santa Barbara Island, and it could be that she was letting down very rapidly through the fog and may have struck the San Miguel. We taxi over the forest here and continue with our adventure. Right here, we were glad for the large tires enable us to get through the branches here and become airborne again. I love these downhill takeoffs into the wind. You don't have to run very far and the plane climbs very rapidly. Also, the large flaps were a great help there in that type of operation. We heard that there were sea elephants upon the island. Now, I had never seen a sea elephant, neither had my son Kent. And I think few people have. They were almost extinct a few years back. This is the California sea lion here, John, that you see racing along the beach there. Here you and are casing a landing spot again. That's right. And the old sea elephants, they look up and we sail right in over their heads. There were literally hundreds of them. Mm-hmm. Look at them scatter. Quite a sight, John. 
Right here is where we were very glad to have the large tires. You'll notice in just a moment a very good illustration on how to treat a whirling propeller. We can take a lesson from this little lady sea elephant. <laughs> she believes in never turn your back upon a spinning prop. Got it in reverse all the way. Yes, sir. She can taxi very well in reverse. Well, as usual, Kent decides on a close examination of everything. You like to see what sort of teeth they have. These animals are quite large, John. 18 feet long and weighing 4,000 pounds, some of them. Woo. Very lovable, playful creatures. They just can't seem to do enough for one another. Oh, this is playing. They seem to be laughing. And this is the bull sea elephant. Things are more business with him. Mm -hmm. Now, this battle is not in fun, John. The two old bulls here, one has trespassed upon the other's property. And they're uh, trading blows. He got in a good one there. The harems are formed, and trespassers always lead to a battle. Sometimes a little lady sea elephant will go for a swim, and a lone bull who has no harem of his own, just a few scars to testify his many battles. Well, he'll start in pursuit of this little cow elephant, and he doesn't realize it, but he is being watched by one of the older bulls. He feels that now is a good time to start a harem of his own. But the old bull gradually comes to life and lumbers down the beach in pursuit. They square off here. They fight with a sort of a chopping motion, and it's very destructive. Sometimes they swim ashore, leaving a trail of blood behind. And in this case, the young bull swims off again. And on shore, the elephants relax and say, well, <laughs> let the boys fight. <laughs> so they settle down, they stretch and yawn. And then they toss a little sand. Some say it uh, eliminates the chances of sunburn. And a little sand on her nose there. A lot of gnats, John. And I think the sand tossing may eliminate the bite of the gnat also. They certainly know how to relax. Kent, he's getting right into the spirit of the thing there. Feels a good scratch coming on. <laughs> they dig a little sand out of their eyes. But finally, John, they do go to sleep. And they snore very much like a human being. Very sound sleepers. You can pull their whiskers and they'll just lay there. Now, here's your little California sea lion. He forgot to look behind him, just like the children do on the beach. And he was rolled a little bit there on that last breaker. He's all in, John, almost uh, exhausted, in fact. <laughs> this looks like his first swimming lesson. Well, it could be. We counted several of the little fellows that weren't quite so fortunate. They had drowned in the heavy surf there. Yeah, but they dry off and go at it again in a few hours. Kent decides to get acquainted here. Oh, they're awful cute little animals. We had a great desire to carry one home with us, but we kept in the back of our mind that they would weigh about five or 600 pounds eventually. <laughs> mm hmm Eat about 40 pounds of fish a day. But isn't this the type of sea lion that's trained for acts all over the country? You're right, John. This is the only species that is intelligent enough to train. And seals from this San Miguel Island are shipped to all parts of the world, air mail. There's a man in Santa Barbara that has been trapping seals for 18 years on the Channel Island group there. Well, we're leaving the west tip. That was a very good landing strip there, one of the best that we had encountered so far, and we didn't look forward to this sand dune flying again, but we wanted to visit the Indian remains, which we learned was upon the island. A very large group of Indians lived here, known as the Canolino Indians. It's the largest Indian camp ever discovered north of the Mexican border. And we're now passing over the remains of their village. It extended for about eight miles in one direction and about a mile in width. And over the entire surface of the ground, there was debris from their camps that reached an average depth of about six feet. Thousands of Indians lived here and made their living off of abalones, seals, and fishing. They were a very friendly Indian. Cabrillo mentioned them in the logs of his vessels. Here we see the remains of a Canolino Indian. Just a little bit of a skull and a leg bone or two there and a few arrowheads, John, is all that the wind had left. The winds that opened this grave sandblasted the contents until nothing but the hard artifacts were left. Here you notice the camp deposits from the Indians. A very concentrated material here of snails and 
seashells, all kinds of bones. This is a digging stone. A lot of work went into the manufacture of this. They would probably use this stone for digging graves or any digging at all it was done by stone. In fact, all of their implements were made of stone, John. Very little wood material, at least it never survived to this time. Now here's a heavy bone implement that has survived. It's fashioned from the rib of a whale and we figure it was probably used for the removal of abalone from the rocks or the reefs along the edge of the coast. Today, there are literally millions of abalone fastened to the reefs around San Miguel, but I think during the time of the Indians, they were probably very rare because, as I say, a vast population existed there, and they probably kept the rocks pretty well cleaned off. I mean, as you said earlier, this was once a very, very lush island. You're right, John. At that time, they also added to their diet acorns. Trees were abundant, of course, in later years, why possibly they lived on fish exclusively there. And the wind is now rising again. John, the wind opens the graves and then it covers them up. And actually the wind is the ruler of San Miguel. It even sculptures the driftwood. Notice the fine etching here on the driftwood. This is driftwood we were looking at. And then the wind moves the sand up the windward side of the slopes, John, and there it spills down the lee side of the slopes and falls upon the beach. And someday the San Miguel Island will cease to exist. It will be known as Danger Shoals on our maps because all the loose material will be blown off into the sea or had spilled down and fallen into the sea and someday we'll have to change things around on the map and it's gradually blowing the island away and now it's literally blowing us off of the island we race back to the plane and we climb aboard there we had seen a great many interesting things on the island and we didn't want to push our luck yes mr jordan one plane wreck on san miguel is quite enough you know, one thing that impressed me was the fact that the conquistadores of centuries ago must have given, or would have given, rather, quite a bit to have owned a small plane like yours. You saw more in a matter of minutes than they saw in days or weeks. Yes, John, you do get a bird's eye view of everything from the air, and with the right type of equipment, you can land for a closer look. Well, you had me on the edge of my seat several times with some of those landings and takeoffs. That plane of yours is quite maneuverable, but uh, don't you risk quite a bit in those landings and takeoffs? Well, John, uh, this plane, as I mentioned before, is specially designed, extra large wheels, large flaps, and with it you can, uh, we'll say, land on a dime and sometimes have a little change left over. Ah, uh, good. Give us an idea of uh, how long an area it, you took to uh, take off a plane and land. About 300 feet, John, with plenty of room. Which isn't much at all. Well, you mentioned during the film, too, that your son is a pre-dental student, which uh, makes us assume that he's going to uh, be a dentist, of course, but. Does he plan to take after his father and be a pilot at any chance? Well, John, uh, personally, I've discouraged him in becoming a pilot. I think he's better off in the pre-dental. And uh, if he makes the grade, I think he would be happier. And then he could really afford the right type of equipment. And uh, if he doesn't make the grade, why, then he has no use for an airplane anyhow. Well, getting back to the island, one thing that impressed me, too, was the fact that these foxes have survived all these years without any uh, fresh water supply. During the wet period of the year, of course, there's plenty of water. During the dry, we still have the heavy coastal fogs, and um, uh, certain areas are damp, a little seepage, and they have learned to subs uh, subsist on much less water, I believe, than their mainland cousins. Well, Mr. Durden, my thanks to you for sharing your fine adventure with us here tonight. I'm sure we've all learned something new about our Pacific coast. I was very glad to be here, John. I hope you enjoyed Deserted Island with Mr. Ed Durden and that you'll join us again next week at the same time for another fascinating journey. And now a final reminder that if you have interesting films of an adventure anywhere in the world, we'd be pleased to hear about it. Just drop me a note, John Stevenson, care of this station, giving full details. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>
into the air again, this time on a flight to the Diomedes. That's Siberia he puts us next to. Journey with Mr. Tekler when he brings us his own film, The Flying Traitor, one week from tonight.